to mention your name but for the precious blood of the Lamb that was slain on Calvary's mountain. Father, we thank you so much that you loved us so much to redeem us from the slave market of sin. We pray today, Heavenly Father, that you bless the preaching of thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Be seated. So good to be in God's house today and to offer up songs of praise and thanks to God. The text this morning is in the book of Exodus. We've been looking at the Ten Commandments, and today we're going to talk about the Fourth Commandment, and the title of the message is Christians and Sunday Worship. Christians and Sunday Worship. And the text is in Exodus chapter 20. We'll be looking at the Fourth Commandment, verses 8 through 11. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. I stumbled across this a few years ago and I've always thought it was humorous. It was a, a New Year's letter was written by a church member to the pastor. Dear pastor, you often stress attendance at worship as being very important for Christians. But I think a person has a right to miss now and then. I think every person ought to be excused for the following reasons and the numbers of times indicated. Christmas holiday, the Sunday before and the Sunday after, that's two Sundays. New Year's, the party went too long, that's one Sunday. Easter, got to get away, that's two Sundays. Fourth of July, it's a national holiday, got to miss a Sunday. Labor Day, need to get away, that's two weeks, two Sundays. Memorial Day, got folks in from out of town, Got to miss that Sunday. School's out. Got to miss that Sunday. The, school, the kids need a break. And then school reopens. Got to have one more fling before start back to school. Got to miss that Sunday. Family reunions. Mine and my wife. So that'll probably be three Sundays. Uh, there'll probably be a couple of Sundays that I'll just sleep late. That's two Sundays. We're going to have some deaths in our family. So that'll probably require us to be away for two Sundays. Anniversary. We'll be going on our anniversary Sunday. That's one Sunday. Sickness, sickness. Well, at least one person in my family is going to be sick at least once. So that's going to be five Sundays we're going to have to miss due to sickness. Uh, business trips uh, take me out of town quite often. I'll miss probably eight Sundays due to business. And then, of course, everybody goes on vacation, and uh, we get three to four weeks of vacation. I'm going to have to miss Six Sundays due to vacation. Bad weather, bad weather. I, I don't get out when it rains or snows or even if it's cloudy. Uh, <laughs> ball games, ball games. I'm going to miss a couple of Sundays. Uh, ball games. The races. The races start before church is out. That's going to be at least two weeks. Uh, we're going to get unexpected company. You know, you just can't walk out on folks, and that'll probably take up two Sundays. And then there's daylight savings time. You know, when, when you spring forward, I always miss. And when we fall back, I, I miss that Sunday too. And, and then there's specials on TV. You know, if there's something just really special on TV, you can't expect me to come to church on that. So we'll probably miss at least three Sundays due to that. So pastor, that leaves two Sundays per year. So you can count on us being at church on the fourth Sunday in February and the third Sunday in August unless we are providentially hindered. <laughs> Sincerely, Luke Warren. Yes. <laughs> now that's comical if it wasn't some truth in there. The fact of the matter is we nervously laugh at that. According to USA Today, a few years ago, this is old, it's probably worse now than it was when they put this statistic out, but according to USA Today, 48% of committed, self-described committed churchgoers attend church an average of one time per month. So let me phrase that another way. People who attend church once a month consider themselves to be faithful Christians. This morning what I want to do is I want to talk about Christians and Sunday worship. 
And the text is, like I said, Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you are to labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your sons or your daughters, your male or female slaves, servants or your cattle or your sojourners who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So we will look at this fourth commandment and as we look at it, I want us to consider the importance of Sunday worship. Now, the question always comes up when you read the fourth commandment, why do Christians worship on Sunday instead of Saturday? I mean, the fourth commandment says, remember the seventh day or the Sabbath day. And it's a question that has spawned countless debates and theological arguments and books and papers and most notably is a denomination called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was founded by a woman named Ellen G. White. Ellen G. White says that people who worship on Sunday cannot go to heaven. She says that Sunday worship is the mark of the beast. And so... If you think Seventh-day Adventism is just another Christian denomination, I got another whole sermon on that. But uh, it confuses people. Why do Christians worship on Sunday and not Saturday? Which is it? Should we come on Saturday or Sunday? Is Sunday the Christian Sabbath, as you've heard it called? And what is the Christian's obligation to Sunday worship? Well, I want to answer those questions, but in order for us to thoroughly understand, we need to get the Sabbath in context. The Sabbath in context. And so there's four things you need to understand about the context of this fourth commandment. The Sabbath in context. First off, you need to look at the Sabbath in the context of creation. The Sabbath in context of creation. The very first reference to the Sabbath is in connection with creation in Genesis chapter two. It says that God there rested on the Sabbath day. Now what it means there is, it means that God stopped creating on the Sabbath day or on the seventh day. God created everything that ever has been created in six days. On the seventh day, God rested. Now, God did not rest because he was wore out from all that creating. God didn't say, oh my goodness, I've got to retire for a while. I'm tired, I'm give out. No, God rested or God ceased because he was finished. There was nothing more to create. It's interesting to me, just as a sideline, that what Jesus said on the cross of Calvary when he dropped his head, just as he breathed his last, his famous words was, it is finished. Jesus finished, completed the work of redemption and that's why we're not working our way to heaven. It's because it's finished. It's the same thing, Genesis chapter two, verse two and three. The seventh day, God completed his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Now, the word sanctify, or by saying that God sanctified the seventh day, means that God established a seven-day week cycle. That's, that's literally what it means. And have you noticed that the whole world, for all of time, has operated on a seven-day week cycle? And really, there's no other explanation for that other than the fact that God set it up. God has created it and it has ordained it from creation that we in our minds and in our social activities and everything operates on a seven day week cycle. Now, when God rested there at creation, 
It does not say that God required Adam and Eve to worship on the Sabbath day. There's no Sabbath institution at creation. It just means God established that cycle, that seven-day cycle. And in Genesis, you never uh, read Noah doesn't worship on the Sabbath day. Abraham doesn't worship on the Sabbath day. Isaac doesn't worship on the Sabbath day. Jacob and none of his sons observed the Sabbath day. It was not a commandment at creation. It was just recognized. The the second thing we're talking about the context now is the Sabbath as a covenant sign. In this text that I just read to you in the fourth commandment is where the Sabbath day was, was instituted and the Sabbath day is a covenant sign with the nation of Israel. Moses reminds the Israelites that God rested on the Sabbath and therefore they are to rest. The Sabbath law, the Sabbath law as instituted here, commands complete and absolute rest. Everything in Israel ceased on the Sabbath day. No work was to be done by anyone, and if anybody did any work on the Sabbath day, they were commanded to put them to death. That's what the Sabbath day means. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 14. Therefore you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from his people. The Sabbath cycle went farther in Israel than just one time per week. The Sabbath cycle translated also into years. Every seventh year was a Sabbath year. Every seventh year they didn't plant their field because they were to let it rest for a year. And then the sevens also went in cycles after 49 years, which I didn't do very well in math in school, but I think that's seven times seven. 49 years, and on the 50th year was called a year of jubilee. And on the year of jubilee, everything went back to its original state. Slaves were returned back. They were set free. Uh, the land went back to its original owners. All debts were canceled. The economy went back to square zero. That'd be good for us today, amen? Uh, but it was a year of jubilee. All debts were canceled. So the Sabbath, as instituted in the Ten Commandments is a covenant sign for Israel. In Exodus chapter 31 and verse 16, it says, the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed. Ezekiel, the prophet, in chapter 20, verse 11 says, I gave Israel my statutes and informed them of my ordinances by which if a man observes them, he will live. Also I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Now, the Sabbath observant, observance was a covenant sign with Israel. God promised in his covenant to protect, to pro bless and provide Israel so long as they observe the terms of the covenant. The total rest observed by Israel was to serve for them as a reminder of their set-apartness, their specialness. Uh, the Sabbath distinguished Israel as a unique nation because none of the Mesopotamian cultures observed a Sabbath day like Israel did. The Sabbath was a sign. 
in the polytheistic culture in which they lived in for a nation, an entire nation, to cease everything and to stop and do no work on a single day. All the surrounding nations were to look upon that and see that the God who created the world in six days and rested on the Sabbath is, is blessing these special people. So this covenant sign was a way to testify to the world of God as the one true God. The Sabbath was a covenant sign for Israel. But Christians are not subject to the terms of the Mosaic Covenant. We do not live under the Mosaic Law. Jesus came and Jesus enacted a better covenant. The Bible says in Hebrews 8, 6, Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. So Gentile Christians, which is what I am and what you is, is not subject to any legal requirements of the old covenant. Now, the third thing I want you to see about the context, we're talking about creation, we're talking about the covenant sign, but also you need to take in consideration of Jesus and the Sabbath. The Sabbath and Christ. You remember Jesus was, man, he was severely criticized by the Pharisees for not keeping the Sabbath. In Luke chapter 5, verse 1, it says, It happened that as he was passing through the grain fields on a Sabbath, and his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them with their hands and eating the grain. Some of the Pharisees said, why do you do what's not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answering them said, have you not even read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest alone, and he gave it to his companions. And he was saying to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And he entered another synagogue, and there was a man there whose hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath so that they could find a reason to accuse him. But he knew what they were thinking, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. And he got up and he came forward, and Jesus said to him, He looked around, and he said, Is it lawful? to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to destroy it. And after looking around at them all, he said, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and the man's hand was restored. But they themselves were filled with rage discussing how they might destroy him. Mark tags that little phrase on the end of that story. He says, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, when Jesus declared himself the Lord of the Sabbath, what he's saying is, number one, he's saying, I am God. And number two, he is saying, since I am God, I have the right to interpret and even change the Sabbath because I am God. And so, by doing that, Jesus established uh, a, a new understanding of the Sabbath. Now God had established the Sabbath as a way to set Israel apart and to provide for them necessary rest and they were to rest and get, be replenished and uh, uh, they were to remember as they rested God had liberated them from slavery that he was their redeemer and so the Sabbath was supposed to be for their benefit. But by the time Jesus came along, they had added so many rules and so many regulations and so many things and, and, and traditions to the Sabbath that it was no longer a blessing, but it was a heavy burden. The Sabbath was not enjoyable anymore. It was designed to give them rest, body, soul, and mind. But instead, their convoluted understanding of the Sabbath day made it a burden. Jesus said they tie heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them so much as even with a finger. So essentially Jesus said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath, and if I want to heal a man, I can heal a man. 
Jesus said that the Sabbath, it, 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 the, the, the purpose of the Sabbath is to do good for other people. Doing good, blessing others, and healing the sick is not a violation of the Sabbath. And then finally, the context of the church, the early church. In the book of Acts, the very first Christians are Jewish, and they worship on the Sabbath. They're still going to the temple. They're still practicing the Jewish customs. They still follow the traditions. And all, by anybody's imagination, they are Jews. But it wasn't long until Gentiles started coming to faith in Christ. And some of those early Jewish believers thought that the Gentile Christians should become Jewish. They should follow the customs of Moses. Especially the men should succumb to the Jewish sign, that covenant sign of circumcision. Jewish Christians wanted to impose Old, Old Testament regulations on the Gentile Christians. And it all came to a head in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Listen to this. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. In other words, you can't just come to Jesus. You've got to become a Jew. It goes on to say in verse 5, some of the sect of the Pharisees had believed, uh, who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and direct them to observe the law of Moses. So in other words, they were trying to impose Old Testament covenant regulations on New Testament Christians. Gentile believers, they said, had to observe the regulations, the signs of Israel. And the Sabbath, remember, was a sign of the covenant. It was what distinguished them as Jews. And so in Acts 15, after much debate, Peter stands up and he says, I've reached a decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols, from fornication, and anything that's been strangled, and from blood. These were things that Gentile pagans practiced, by the way, drinking blood and stuff like that. Peter says they need to stay away from that. For in every city, for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. In other words, Gentile Christians are under no obligation to follow the law of Moses. They don't have to observe the signs. They don't have to be circumcised. They don't have to follow the holidays. They don't have to go to the feast. They don't have to observe the rituals. And they do not have to obey the Sabbath day. It's interesting, from Acts chapter 15 on in the rest of the Bible, you never see the church gathering on the Sabbath day. It's always on Sunday. Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Now that's a church service. Sunday all the way up to midnight. Amen. <laughs> Don't y'all amen that. You couldn't stand it. <laughs> Neither could I. But 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. On the first day of the week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections may be made. So in other words, in the, in the early church, they gave money, they taught, they sang, they had church on Sunday. And Paul states in Colossians emphatically that Christians are not obligated to keep the Sabbath day. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Things which were a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. See, the early church, the Gentile Christians began to worship the Lord on Sunday instead of Saturday. Now, it's interesting there is no scripture passage 
commanding Christians to worship on Sunday. You, you won't read in the New Testament, remember the first day of the week and keep it holy. You don't, you don't read that. There's no passage commanding us to worship on Sunday. Neither is there a passage that commands us not to worship on Saturday. There's nothing in the Bible that says you have to worship on Sunday. There's nothing in the New Testament that says stop worshiping on Saturday. So why do we worship on Sunday? Basically what we have is the example of the early church. And they never do say why they changed from Saturday to Sunday except there's a couple of good reasons. One is they probably began worshiping on Sunday as a way to celebrate the resurrection. Jesus died, was buried, and early on the first day of the week, he rose from the grave. So Christians adopted Sunday as the day to celebrate the resurrection. The second thing is, and I think this is very important, is that the early church adopted Sunday as a way to distinguish themselves from Judaism. The Roman pagans saw the early Christians as just a sect of Jews. They thought they were just Jews that believed in Jesus. So the church wanted to distinguish themselves so by not worshiping on the Sabbath day and worshiping on the Lord's day, they set themselves apart. In other words, Sunday became a sign for them that they were followers of Jesus. And so by the time you get to the book of Revelation, the transition is made. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Sunday, by the time of the book of Revelation, becomes the Lord's day. So I'm going to just review very quickly, and then I want to make a few points, and then we'll be done. God set up a seven-day week cycle at creation. When God made the Mosaic Covenant, Sabbath rest was a sign that distinguished the Hebrews from the other nations. Jesus declared himself Lord of the Sabbath and corrected the Jewish misunderstandings and abuses of the Sabbath. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus established a new covenant in his blood, making the old covenant obsolete. No one, I repeat, no one, Jew or Gentile is obligated to live under the Mosaic Covenant any longer. Therefore, the Sabbath and the law, uh, uh, the Sabbath law was a sign of the covenant with Israel and is now void. Listen to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. When he said a new covenant, he made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. So the writer of the New Testament says the old covenant's obsolete, we're under a new covenant, and we're not bound to abide by the stipulations of the old covenant. And I'm going to tell you something, I for one am real glad we don't have to observe the Sabbath day. You say, why? Well, if y'all missed, I'd have to kill you. Seriously, they had a lot of things that you could die for under the Mosaic Covenant. They were commanded, listen to this, kids. They were commanded to stone to death rebellious children. I don't know, that might be a good idea. <laughs> Deuteronomy 21, 18, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or his mother, and when they chastise him, he will not even listen to them, then his father and his mother shall seize him, bring him out to the elders of the city at the gateway of the hometown. They shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He won't obey us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death. So you will remove the evil from your midst and all of Israel will hear it and will fear Whoa, that's under the Mosaic Covenant. I'm going to tell you something else. You know, Moses was commanded to stone homosexuals. That's not politically correct. Anyone who broke the Sabbath day was put to death. 
If you got caught in adultery, you got killed. If you went to visit a fortune teller, they drug you out to the side of a hill, threw you off a cliff and piled rocks on you. You're dead. You're gone. You're out of here. That's why Galatians says in Galatians 3.10, For as many who are under the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. I'm glad I don't live under the Old Testament covenant. I'm glad that Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross as a sacrificial lamb to pay my debt in full. And when he rose from the grave, he fulfilled all the demands of the law for me. And Romans chapter 10 verse 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Jesus imputes his righteousness to us. And that's how we're saved, not by keeping the law or its commands. Now, I haven't explained that we are no longer obligated to observe the Sabbath. Let's look at some issues with Sunday worship. And I'll go through these very quickly, and, and, and you can decide what you want to think about them. Christians and Sunday worship. Number one, Christians are not legally obligated to worship on Sunday. We're not legally bound and obligated like they were in the Old Testament to worship on Sunday. We're not saved by attending worship, nor do we lose our salvation if we miss church. Unlike Old Testament Christians, I'm sorry, Old Testament Jews, Christian leadership is not obligated to punish people for not attending church. Aren't you glad of that? <laughs> Don't say amen. Pastors and elders are not obligated to stone people who miss Sunday services, and I'm glad of that. I mean, on Super Bowl Sunday, we'd lose half our church. <laughs> for those who love the Lord Jesus Christ, regular worship Regular church attendance is not considered a chore. It is the joy of our life. I don't attend church because I have to. I do not come here every Sunday because I'm paid to. I'd go to church if I wasn't the pastor. I'd go to church if I couldn't talk. I, I'm serious. I love church. I love the church. I love you because you're my brother in Christ. I, I tell you, if I won free tickets to the Super Bowl, I would come to church that Sunday instead of going to the Super Bowl. That's because I value my congregational life way more than any silly ball game. That's just me. So we're not legally obligated. We do it because we want to. Sunday is not the Christian Sabbath. Now, I know people use that term and don't really know what they mean, but Sunday's not the Christian Sabbath. Sunday's not the day, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Sunday is the day that our congregation has mutually decided and established as our day of the week to worship. However, we need to understand that Scripture does not say, remember Sunday and keep it holy. It does not say you cannot work on Sunday. Sunday is not a Christianized version of the Sabbath. In the book of Acts, churches met together to worship, receive instruction, to teach, to give offerings, to encourage one another. And somebody says, well then, why go to church at all if we don't have to? Why not just blow it off? Have a good time. Go fishing every Sunday. After all, you just said we don't have to go to church on Sunday. And you're right. There's no law commanding Christians to go to church and worship on Sunday. But there are some things that you may want to consider. What are those things? Well, listen to this. Even though we are not legally bound to keep the Sabbath, the seven-day cycle is still instructive. For us as Christians. 
The Bible says in Romans 15, 4, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. The Sabbath law instructs Christians about worship and rest. If God required weekly worship in the Old Testament, it makes sense that God enjoys weekly worship in the New Testament. How many of God's people have a seven-day rhythm of rest? If I was to say, give testimony or stand up or raise your hand, I'm not going to, how many of y'all intend to take a nap this afternoon? I believe it'd be an overwhelming majority. If you're not going to get to and you're used to it, you probably feel cheated. I'm going to be honest with you. When I leave here, I go home and I eat as much as I can get in my stomach and then I sleep till it's time to come back. That's just, I, I like a day of rest. I just do. I don't think one day out of seven to remind ourselves how God redeemed us through the blood of his dear son would be harmful. How, how, how many families, think about this for a minute. How many families have ruined the spiritual life of their children through neglecting regular Sunday worship? I, I've seen it over and over and over and over and over. Every single summer rolls around and some family with small children decides we're going to blow off our responsibility. We're not going to worship the Lord this Sunday and they never ever return to church. One man told me, he said, Pastor, he said, uh, you know, it's April. And he said, you won't be seeing much of me until about October. And I said, well, that's a shame. He had a 10-year-old son. I said, why is that? Well, he said, you know, we're involved in Little League. And he said, he goes in these tournaments and we go all about. And I just curious, and I wasn't mean to him. I wasn't even sarcastic as much as I wanted to be. But I said, I just want to ask you something. How much money do you spend on Little League? He said, you know what? I probably spent $5,000 last year on Little League. If you count all the food and eating out and the hotels and the traveling and gas and equipment and dues and tournaments. And, yeah, he said, I spent $5,000 last year. And it was sad because little Johnny couldn't tell you three of the apostles, four of the books of the Bible, didn't know the plan of salvation, he couldn't pray, but by gosh, he could play baseball. And we got our priorities right. One man came and said, Pastor, he said, I've got an opportunity to take my family and he named an activity and he said, now, it's going to mean that I'm going to have to miss church about six months out of the year. He said, but when we do this activity, they have a chaplain that comes and we have a little devotion before we do it. Don't you think it's okay? I said, nope. Well, what's wrong with it? I said, your family, your children need to be plugged into a church where not only are they receiving, but they are giving. Oh, He's mad at me. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you want to ask me a question and you don't want to hear what i got to say, don't be mad at me when I tell you the truth, okay? He, he kept dragging himself to church that Sunday like he was mad. He was missing out on something good. The next year, he didn't ask and he just did it. Well, I'm just going to tell you right now, from that point on, his children quit coming to church and today they are a spiritual wreck because he took them out of the house of God on a regular basis. So it's just the seven-day cycle is instructive. We're not legally bound, but it's good for us. And then does our attitude about weekly worship say something about where we are spiritually? If going to church seems like a chore, then where is my heart? <coughs> Where is my heart? If spending one hour a week in a climate-controlled, padded, big screen, acoustical climate-controlled building seems difficult, what does that say about my spiritual condition? If we come for a measly hour-long worship service twice a month, all the while wishing we were somewhere else, sit with our arms folded with an attitude of, bless me if you can, 
while all the long we're going out the back door when we should be coming to the altar doing the invitation so we can beat the Methodists to the buffet line. What does that say about us as Christians? I'm here to tell you, probably we're not. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how God must feel in view of for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life and we're sitting here saying, get me out of this place. It says something about us, doesn't it? And then finally, if I only attend church to receive, what does that say about my spiritual condition? If I come primarily to get See, I hear people a lot of times say, well, I went to church over there. I just didn't get nothing out of it. The question is, what did you put into it? Back in the 90s, somehow we developed as church growth strategy this thing called marketing the church. Marketing the church. The basic strategy was kind of like the old Burger King commercials. You know, Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us serve it your way. And church, churches in the 90s copied that marketing strategy that said the customers were the people who don't attend our church and we need to create a church that's offering things to our so-called customers that will uh, uh, drive, will, will entice them to come in our doors. And so churches had to have all the bells and all the whistles and all the lights and all the dramas electrifying music productions. We had to have child care that was a combination of a McDonald's playground, the hospital nursery. The, chill, the building of the grounds had to be groomed to perfection. It, it, everything had to be, the, the phrase was, user-friendly. And really all those things are not bad, but I believe the unintended consequence was over the years, we developed in the church a cafeteria mentality. You know, when you go in a cafeteria, you get your tray, you walk down the serving line, you say, I want that, I don't want that, I don't want that, I'll take some of that, and then you go sit with your friends and leave the mess so somebody else can clean it up. In our attempt to give people what they want, we created a climate where the customers are king. I got news for you. There's only one king of the church, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The question I have is this. It's a very simple one. If everybody is a customer, who is the workers? Beloved, attend church and receive. There's nothing wrong with that, but also attend church to give. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, Sunday worship, is really a heart matter. It's not a law matter. It's not a commandment matter. It's a matter of where am I at spiritually. And the question is, from my heart, do I love Jesus and his people? Can you imagine telling the Apostle Paul, now Paul, you got to go to church this Sunday. And can you imagine the Apostle Paul answering back, do I have to? What about Peter? Peter's there on the seaside and the Lord Jesus Christ says to him three times, Peter, tend my lambs. And you go to him, Peter, now it's Sunday, we gotta go to church. Well, golly, I went twice this month. There's something good on television. I don't wanna go today. You see, love for the Lord Jesus Christ and love for the Lord's people motivates us to attend regular worship services. 
Peter says in 1 Peter 1, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. In a small village, there was once a very wise pastor and he had a parishioner who was frequently absent from the Sunday morning worship services. He knew if he went out there and told this guy, you know, uh, you've been missing church and that's bad and you're a sinner. And he approached it that way, the guy would immediately get defensive and rebel and they wouldn't do any good. So he prayed about it and he said, Lord, I need to talk to him about his, his worship attendance. And so he went out to visit this guy and after some small talk, the pastor said to him, we'll call him John. He said, John, I've noticed that you miss Sunday worship services Actually, you miss more than you attend. Is there something going on? Is there some reason that you miss church so much? And John said, Pastor, I can be as good a Christian without attending church as I can by going every single Sunday. Well, like I said, this is a wise pastor. He didn't say anything, but he walked over to the fire and he took out some tongs that were beside the fire and he dug deep down into the hot blazing coal and he got a hold of a big blazing red coal and he pulled it out of the fire and he laid it by itself on the hearth. And he didn't say a word. But they both stood there and watched that single solitary blazing coal turn to ash and go to freezing cold all alone. We well, see, that preacher must have preached a very powerful message with that illustration because according to his testimony, John became regular in his worship attendance. You see, we as believers, we just don't, we just don't make it by ourselves. Christianity is a team sport, if you will. And we need the fellowship of one another and regular worship attendance. So the question is this morning is, what about you? Where is your heart? Is your heart right with God? Is your heart right with God's church? Are you dedicated to Christ and are you dedicated to his church? Would you stand with me as we bow our heads in prayer? With every head bowed and every eye closed, the message is regular Sunday worship attendance. And I'm glad, dear Lord, I'm just so glad that you have set us free from legal obligations of a Sabbath day. But Lord, I, I shudder to think what would happen if you imposed that upon us again. The Lord, we are free. We are free to, to come and go and to worship you. Help us today, Lord, examine our attitude toward corporate body life as a believer in Christ. That we don't live unto ourselves, but we are united together in the bond of Christ and that we are responsible to love one another and to encourage one another and to do it more as we see the day approaching. Father, I pray today that this message has struck chords in people's hearts that we will take serious our commitment to the body of Christ. And if there's those here today who need to make a decision to become faithful in church, then I pray today they do that. And Father, if there are those here today who are not saved, who've never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, then I pray today would be the day that they trust Christ. Father, there may be those here today who have heartaches and pains and need to come for prayer and encouragement. Maybe they need to get a friend by the hand and just come to this altar and here pour out their heart to you. I pray today, God, you'd give them encouragement. Father, there may be those who want to join this church and become an active member in this fellowship. I pray today, God, that if that's their heart's desire, that they come during this song of invitation. Thank you for Jesus.
And it's in his holy name that we pray. Amen. If you need to come, won't you come?